Let's do this. The Cult of Hockey podcast by the faithful and for the faithful. I'm David Staples of the Edmonton Journal, and I'm here today with Bruce McCurdy. Hey, Bruce. Hey, David. How are you doing today? <laughs> the Bruce puts a smile on your face. That's good. I think I, just like the YouTube comments, people seem to react to that as well. So mm -hmm. how that started. But anyway. Good or, ba good or bad, they respond. I've seen uh, a couple, couple, yeah. couple of... Uh, so, Bruce, we got some uh, breaking news today. Mm -hmm. has signed with the Edmonton Oilers. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about Ethan Bear's parting comments as he leaves Edmonton. We will talk about the big boys bomb, which is about to hit the Edmonton Oilers. And we'll talk about the Derek Ryan signing. That's kind of leftover business. Plus, we'll dig into a little bit of a rumor that came up that uh, uh, had Oilers fans a Twitter on Twitter and other places yesterday, Corpus Allo for Koskinen plus was the rumor. We'll dig into that. What do you think of the Fogel signing, Bruce? Three years, two point seven five million dollars. What's your take? Well, I guess if you're going to upgrade. You have to expect to pay for it. Uh, I mean, this is a sort of a contract range that the Oilers haven't really been exploring in recent years. They've either had great big contracts at the top end or uh, a lot of ones, you know, in the in the one one to two million dollar range or even the seven hundred thousand to to uh, one point five million dollar range, really a lot of them. Uh, but it seems to be fairly commensurate with uh, the game that Fogel brings. I mean, he's uh, 25 years old, he's presumably still getting better, you know, certainly a statistical profile says he is. Three three goals, three seasons already of double-digit goals and not at all pumped up by power play or, you know, playing on the Sebastian Ajo, Toy Vuteravainen line or anything like that. Like he's a middle six uh, grinder and, and uh, gets results. And so the orders have locked the guy up at a reasonable cost. I mean... One way to look at it is that he's making uh, less than half of what the Oilers previously paid Milan Lucic or James Neal to do a job with a, you know, more or less three left wing. So, uh, and he's younger and improving and arguably better than those guys already. In fact, I'd say it's not even that arguable. I'd say he is better than those guys already and he's going to help. He, he has scored at... Um the rate of a second line winger in the NHL for the last two seasons, Bruce. He's he's averaged uh, about 1.8 points per 60, which is a fairly good rate of scoring at even strength. Especially as you say, I didn't know that that I hadn't dug into this player too much. I haven't written about him yet. That he didn't. I didn't understand that he had not gotten much time with their top attackers, Aho and Taravainen in in Carolina. So that's that's even better. Um, you know, it's significantly better than most players on the Oilers, most wingers on the Oilers. And I, I, I was hoping that he wouldn't sign like, like, uh, let's look at the Puglia-Yarvi contract. Um, it was good, for instance, that was two years, right? Because um, yeah. if he had had the year that he just had, he'd be signing for considerably more right now. And I like that where you cover yourself on a player like this. He's 25 years old. He's, if he's going to be a good NHL player, good NHL winger, these are the years for a player like this. You know, a somewhat physical yep. player, uh, drives the net. Uh, th this is the moment where you're going to, if you're going to make a bet on him as an NHLer, this is exactly the time. So if you just signed him for one year, um, let's say they got him one year at $2 million a year, or $1.9 million or $1.5 or whatever it might be. Um, probably would be more than that, but... They they would just the second he has steps up as he's 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 a bet good bet to do or at least be as good as he's been you're gonna have to pay more and um, now they're 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 paying a bit more in the first year than they would have paid I think for for this player but if he steps up and has a big year let's say 20 goals and 20 assists something like that um, then they're covered and that's yeah. not out of the question for this player 20 goals and 20 assists and a 
And if it, and if he's part of a team that goes deep in the playoffs as well, which is a, also a possibility, then then costs really start to go up. We're seeing with Darnell Nurse, for instance, how quickly things can escalate for our, for players in certain <coughs> certain pay categories. Oh, so yeah. yeah, he might you know there might be a nine at the front of his contract. Well, there is before. and everybody else's. So yeah, so I, I mean I can't believe some of the stuff I'm seeing. I guess I mean, we could talk I'm about that too. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, so Fogel is a good, I like that. The three years here, I think this is a good bet. This isn't, a lot, I would say a lot of Holland's moves this summer have been kind of 50-50 bets, which I don't think are good enough for mm-hmm. for an NHL GM to make a, a constant series of 50-50 bets. That's not good enough. You got you to gotta make these 75, 80% bets. And this is, this is in that category. I, I, I quite like this move. Meaning the contract as opposed to the trade that brought the guy here that cost him Ethan Bear, or are you talking about specifically the contract they've signed? This contract. Right. The contract and the contracts are always different than the player, right? Like yes. there's the player's performance. 100%. 100%. Then then there's then then there's how much yeah, then there's does it merit the cap hit that he gets, which is a whole different issue because a guy who gets 40, 40 points and earns eleven million dollars a year. Is different than gets forty points and earns two million dollars a year. So I'm saying that this this contract looks like an eighty percent bet to kind of work out, and that's I think it's a that's good work by Ken Holland. I, I like it. Yeah, I just looked up his teammates by the way in Carolina just to prove to myself I wasn't talking through my hat. And uh, his most common linemen was Jordan Stahl, uh, who he played two thirds of his time with, and he, and the other wing was split between. Uh, Jordan Martinuk and Brock McGinn. So, you know, middle six, good players. Those guys are all good players, but they're, you know, none of them are as a star, really. None of them is a scorer. So that's even more encouraging to me, actually, when I hear those mm-hmm. names. I mean, they're they're decent players, but none of them are strong offensive players anymore. So, hey, Bruce, was there, just, just before we move on, was there, did you want to make a correction on what was it that you wanted? To, was it the Koskinen thing? You, you remember we were talking the other day where you got, you, you mentioned to me that you had gotten some, oh, it was um, the buyout, whether mm-hmm. Koskinen could be oh. sent to the minors. And you were yeah. suggesting I, you were debating it. whether I this totally was a brilliant idea it. or not. And I was thinking, uh, are you sure you can do this? And now now you're sure that they can't. So why yeah. are you sure they can't bury Koskinen's contract to get under the cap at the start of the year? Speaking of talking out of my hat, um, uh, which is a polite way of saying talking out of my ass, uh, I was... Uh, uh, grasping at things mid podcast as opposed to thinking them through which is generally a mistake uh <clears throat> the idea of burying a Mikko Koskinen in the minors uh for a day and then bringing him back they can only bury 1.125 million dollars which in the case of Koskinen is exactly 25 percent of his cap hit but that's all they can bury so it's not like they can do a dollar for dollar exchange any any big contract they send to the miners, the maximum they can they can uh, bury oh. at the minor league level is uh, is <clears throat> NHL minimum plus three seventy five, and the minimum now seven fifty. So one point one two five is a magic number for the next two years of how, how much can be buried of any contracts. Just like they sent Kyle Turris down, they're still going to have to eat five hundred and twenty five thousand of his cap hit, and. Even if it's a short-term thing, you have to follow those same rules. So my so, nifty so get, get around. This is this is kindergarten stuff, and I'm kind of embarrassed, but I just messed it up. So that's for any NHL team. That's the rule. It's not just yes. it's, it's, yeah, the, the yeah, most yeah. you can the most you can send to the farm at any one moment to get under the mm-hmm. become cap compliant is one point two five million. One point one two five million. One point one so, point two five. Okay. Yeah, it's. Well, I mean, there's been teams that gotten around it. You remember the infamous Wade Redden debacle, where the New York Rangers sent him down to the minors and just left him there forever to get rid of his big cap hit. And at the CBA of 2012, I think they dealt with that because it, it really left Wade Redden no no path out, no path back to the NHL. So they set a an upper limit of how much can be buried. And uh, so then uh, I think Toronto came up with this concept that they call Robodaw Island, where they buried Stefan Robodaw for the end of his career. But I think that was more of an injury-related thing. But it's uh, uh, 
it's not a, it's a partial solution but it doesn't just solve like there there's no way they're they're doing anything but starting the season with cleft bomb on long-term injured reserve because they're already just about maxed out on salary cap data these salary cap issues mm-hmm. um all of them are both hard to understand and hard yep. to explain uh, we, yep. for instance we heard ken holland recently in a press conference talk about f- for five minutes about some issue ar- around the cap mm-hmm. i think it was around mm-hmm. cleft bomb retaining yep. blah blah he made zero, he made absolutely zero sense to me, Bruce. And I listened to it, I think, twice. And mm-hmm. I couldn't get grasped what he was. Maybe other people grasped it and I didn't. That's a possibility. But I, he just, it just I, was around and around it went. And I just didn't get what he was trying to say. Or even what, like, even the mechanical part of what he was saying in terms of the, how the salary cap work, he didn't, he was unable to explain it, at least so that I could grasp it. I got, I got the gist of it, but uh, he was talking about LTI. And he was he was going around circles, and I actually got a little bit concerned when he couldn't subtract 4.1 from 81.5 on the fly. Like, but anyway, that was just under pressure of the moment, I guess. But, <laughs> yeah. Fact is that uh, they're now so close to the salary cap, and this Vogel uh, contract kind of hammers it shut that they're going to be uh, going to be placing Oscar on LTI before uh, the season even starts and that will hamper their flexibility throughout the season as we saw last season so fogel there's a non-zero chance like there's a there's a decent chance at least it's there's a it's almost 100 percent. at some point he's going to be playing with mcdavid and dry settle next year if he if know. yamamoto or pulley rv or whoever um doesn't work out there or hyman in theory like you know if someone gets hurt this guy could be a top line winger he'd be the first guy that gets the call i'm guessing um, so he's he's going to be a, a big player on the Oilers. He's not core twelve, Bruce. He's right. not a center, but right. if he moves up to the one of the top lines, he is core twelve. Right. I mean, his his scoring is better than Puliyarvi's was mm-hmm. better than Puliyarvi's last year. Better than Yamamoto's last year. I mean, he could easily be playing ahead of one of the, those two players on the top line. Is the truth. So I mean, we we all are talking about him now as a third liner. He he might not see that, and right. and he might not be that. So. Um, he's he's paid below the NHL average salary um, of 3.1, I think, whatever it is now. So, um, all right, Bruce, let's let's talk about the trade itself. Um, we did talk about it the day of. Right. You know, I'm I'm personally um, good with the trade. Mm-hmm. Um, the Oilers have you have a surplus of defensemen, um, you, even though you don't have enough really good defensemen. Mm-hmm. Um, you do have a surplus of young defensemen yep. and below Jones and bear are this, are a group of young players bubbling up. And I, I think the prudent thing to do in that, in that situation is, um, I, is to trade, uh, Jones and bear and, and bring in other talent and let the, let those young guys bubble up because it, you're in a situation where Jones and bear may have peaked, may not have peaked. It's kind of iffy. You don't know, but there's undeniable an even greater potential in players like Bouchard and, and Broberg. And I, and I would argue Sam Arukov as well, as, as opposed to Bear and Jones. And I, not everyone's going to agree with that, but that's my opinion. So I, I like the trade. I, it made sense in that regard. You got a surplus, you got a need. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Probably. Turn, turn your, turn your surplus in, you know, fill your need with your surplus. And I, I see that's what they did. The other reason I supported the trade was because of, I felt there was a lot of pressure on Ethan Bear. That was my sense of uh, maybe it's just me. Be, like I'm in the public eye, you're in the public eye. I'm in the, I'm in the public eye in a political sense as well. Yeah. And I have some understanding of what that's like. And mm-hmm. Bear, in a, in, in, he, in a much greater way, much more significant way, uh, is in the public eye because of because he's First Nations, and it came to a head this year, and he became um, very prominent because of racist comments made against him. Mm-hmm. And um, I just, I just have a sense that as a hockey player that is a great weight to carry on your back being a representative of um your people being in the public eye like that mm-hmm. uh in 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 having negative comments thrown your way um even the all the attention the support about your identity puts a certain kind of pressure on you you're just not a hockey player you're more than that and it's a it's, it's a burden and i think um i unless I'm reading his comments wrong, it seems like Ethan Barris saying the same thing in his parting comments. What did he say, Bruce? 
Yeah, his comments were uh, were interesting, and uh, uh, he says everything always happens for a reason, and I think this is perfect timing. Everything I had to go through last year, it would have been pretty tough to push through it and battle all the adversity I would have had to deal with in Edmonton. Looking forward to a new step and a fresh start. And then he went on specifically to talk about the social media uh, aspect, or as I sometimes think of it, the anti-social media aspect. Online can be pretty hard. People shouldn't be saying that stuff, talking the way they do, but some just don't have anything better to do with their lives. Playing in Edmonton was pretty stressful. I'm going to hit the ground running and just have fun again. I honestly can't wait. I have a new energy. I want to make a good first impression. So a lot of that is the player, I think, turning the page. And you hear these, not those exact kind of comments, but you hear the type of comments when a player does get traded of, of him sort of opening, turning, literally turning the page to the next chapter and trying to trying to rationalize why it's better off for him and, and going forward and so on. I mean, I don't know that he hated it in Edmonton. I think there was a lot of things he, that he uh, uh, that he really enjoyed about being here and being close to home and so on. And certainly my take on the um, outrageous racist BS that came down just after the playoffs was the response from the community was very, very strong and very, very positive and, and, uh, uh, which, you know, I mean, it shouldn't have been necessary, but at least, the, at least the pushback from a wide range of people was, was very, very good. But, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's kind of, kind of a moot point now, right? I mean, he's, uh, he's on his way and, and, uh, 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 uh to a new team and we have, um, uh, we have to turn the page as well, I guess. And it's uh, at least, as you say, he got traded for value. He got traded for need. And the other point you made, which I made also in my recent post, was that uh, uh, however many young defensemen the Oilers have, uh, whatever the limit is that they're that they're going to dress in the in the lineup at any given time, is less than all of them. They just had so many young defensemen, and both Holland and Tippett are big fans of uh, veteran defensemen. I'm going to kill this phone. Sorry, I thought I'd done that. Uh, and so you can think of the previous wave as being Bear, Jones, and William Lagesson, who's still around. And you can think of the current upcoming wave as being Bouchard, Broberry, and Sam Samorkov. And Clearly, the newer wave is younger. They don't have the, the you know the years of of development that the other guys did, but they're coming from a way higher platform. I mean, two of them were first round draft picks. Uh, Smorkov was a third round pick who you know exceeded quickly. Like he he was uh, a great player before he left junior, as was Ethan Bear. To be fair, uh, became a great player before he left junior. But uh, um, I think. We won't be waiting until those guys are 24 and 25 years old and still going, well, what what do we have here? We don't exactly know. <clears throat> so the way has been cleared for those guys to push into the lineup sooner. And, yeah. I, I think one of Jones and Bear is likely to become a top four. I wouldn't say both of them. Like with Jones, I'd say it's like a, you know, 30% bet, 20% bet that he becomes a top four. With Bear, I'd say it's more of a coin flip. Like I think he's... He, he could go up or he could go down. And that would be my guess. Like, I have, I don't know. Like, it's literally 50-50. Listening, just hearing you read his comments, you could read his comments in terms of struggle last year, not about, um, just, just about the hockey stuff alone. That could just be hockey related. His struggle on the team, you know, he was inconsistent last year. He was up and down. He he uh, was in and out of the lineup. Um, he was, he would, he had different partners. You could see that, you know, things weren't hunky-dory completely with his coach, between him and his coach. And mm-hmm. and that most of the struggle last year could have, could be related to that. So, And in terms of the other thing, I just think some people really thrive in, in terms of being a political person and a political figure and a, right. and a sim- symbol. And others don't. Mm-hmm. And my reading of Ethan Bear, just looking at the guy, like seeing him and, and se- sensing his personality, I didn't really think that was his cup of tea. He just strikes me as a as a great young guy and a and a super hockey player. And now in Carolina, that's all he has to be. That's all he is. And I just think that's really great for him. 
think that's probably the best thing for him. And he's just going to go there and be a hockey player. That's it. That's good. And I think it, it increases his oper- chances of, of succeeding without that kind of pressure um, and, um, around him. Um, Bruce, you mentioned the, the one guy who's left is Logason mm-hmm. from that from that earlier cohort. I wrote a right. post about the big boys bomb. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was a fun way of saying the Oilers got a lot, a lot of big defensemen in, in right. the pipeline. I, I counted 10 of them. And um, I, I think the idea, and I'm gathering this from things I've heard on the radio and just, you know, social media and, you know, things from management is they want a lot of big guys. They want some big boys back there on the blue line. They want, you know, some 6'3", six, 6'4", six, guys, you know, mm-hmm. all of them at least 6'2", that kind of thing. And they don't have to be big Bobby Clobbers. They don't have to rub you out all the time. But the, you got to be able to get in the way of the att- the attacking uh, forward, stop the cycle, get in the way of them. And you got to be able, you don't have to rush the puck like Paul Coffey or even Darnell Nurse. But you've got to be able to quickly pass the puck and hit Connor McDavid on the fly. So, you know, retrieve the puck, make a quick move uh, to evade the forechecker, uh, and make a quick pass to either McDavid or to your defense partner to move that puck out of there. That's, I think, the the that's the prototypical defenseman that they're trying to get right now uh, on the Edmonton Oilers. And it's it's not asking, it's asking, well, it's asking a lot because how many guys in the NHL are just that kind of player, right? They're very valued if you can find them. But the Oilers, I think, are specifically looking for that player in the draft and actually have been for some tra- time. I think that uh, Craig McTavish started this trend when he drafted Darnell Nurse in 2013. McT- McTavish was looking for bigger skilled players, and that was reflected in his first two draft picks in, in Nurse and Dreisaitl. In, in 2014, they drafted Logason, and uh, they took a kind of a hiatus. They took a different kind of defenseman when Shirelli took over in 2015. They took three somewhat smaller puck movers in Marino, Bear, and uh, Caleb Jones. Not small guys, but they're not they're not these kind of defensemen that I'm talking about. <clears throat> right. But then Shirelli quickly went big, big, big. So he next year he drafts Nima Leinen and Philip Berglund, two big European players, and they're and Nima Leinen's huge, six six. The next year, it's uh, 2017, he drafts Samarukov and Kemp. Both of those are real big boys, and Samarukov can really skate. Um, the year after that, he he takes uh, Evan Bouchard, who's a big player, and Kesselring, who's really big. He's 6'5", and, and his dad has told me that he's 215 now. He, he You read the hockey DB, it says he's 205. Elite players say he's 205. Those His dad told me a year ago he's 215. I don't know what he is now. But uh, he, he is a big guy and getting bigger. Then they take the year after that, they take Philip Robury. And then they skip a year. They take all forwards because they have a deficit there. And then this year they come back to it. They take two big defensemen in the draft with their limited picks, Luca Munzenberger and Maximus, oh. Maximus Wanner, Wanner. So, Bruce. I noticed they didn't guys. pick his little brother, Minimus. <laughs> <laughs> Minimus got no love from the Oilers. <laughs> He, the tiger ate Minimus. Maximus <laughs> killed the tiger. Um, Bruce, what do you uh, what do you make of this trend? What do you think about it? Well, it's trend. It's I mean, I I saw somebody posted a graphic somewhere talking about how big were the top fours of the Stanley Cup finalists from the last two years, and uh, both teams were well. Tampa Bay was two of the four teams, of course, with their uh, with their big guys on the uh, on the back end, and uh, Montreal had four very large men as their big four, with Jeff Petrie basically being the smallest of them, and, and uh, uh, you know, uh, Ben Sherrod, Shea Weber, and Edmondson. Uh, Joel Edmondson. And uh, last year, uh, you know, Dallas had guys like Heiskanen, Oleksiak, you know, like the average height and weight of the of the top four. The finalists was 6'3 and 215 or 220 or something. But in truth, it's been a trend forever. Yeah. People like big defensemen. I remember the Oilers of 1990 winning the Stanley Cup and uh, Harry Neal talking about the six tall pine trees they had on defense, right? Guys like uh, Randy Gregg, Steve Smith, uh, you know, uh, Kevin Lowe, all guys that were, you know, 6'2", 6'3". Um, uh, Jeff Bukaboom was on that team. 
And it's always been a, pref a preference, not a necessity, just a preference of coaches to have, uh, and not even necessarily every single defenseman. Obviously, there's room for, for smaller guys. I mean, the Oilers just signed Tyson Berry to a three-year extension. And uh, they just traded for Duncan Keith, who's, uh, you know, not not a monster by any means. But uh, uh, you want to have at least some. Like, if you have a defense that was shaping up that the Oilers might have uh, have uh, four or even five defenders below 200 pounds playing on a yeah. game night. That's a small crew. I mean, you got Darnell Nurse, but even Darnell's not out on the ice for 60 minutes of a game, right? So that you you want to have uh, uh, some uh, some side. Like, there's 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 just there's advantages for for uh, for reach, for leverage, just for pure strength and puck battles, for protecting the net front. You know, there's there's a lot of reasons that uh, uh, size matters. Uh, and on the back end, and so finding at least a balance for that, and uh, you know, if it comes to your driving thing, well, we want we only want to draft him if he's big. That would be a mistake. But if you have a choice between a big guy and a small guy, and it's equal, I mean, that's otherwise, and then, uh, then that might be a, a, a worthwhile uh, tiebreaker. Let's call it that way. The Oilers have ten players in this kind of category in this big boys brigade. And the good thing is that uh, five are lefties and five are righties. So, um, you know, they need, they probably need about, well, if the orders are going to be a competitive team in the McDavid era, they're going to need replacement players who are cheap. A lot of these players are going to be coming along two, three years from now and they, they will be cheap. And if they can get, if they can get two top four D men out of that group, and if they can get two more bottom pairing D men out of this group, this Oilers team will be really well served. And I don't think that's too much of an ask because of the talent of these players. I mean, between Bouchard, Broberry, and and Samarukov, I think that they should be able to get two top four D men. It'll be very disappointing if they don't. So, um, Bruce Derek Ryan, mm -hmm. uh, we, last podcast we we did just as they were about to sign Ryan. What do you mm -hmm. think of that signing? What's your no, it was pretty strange. Eh? I mean, Ken Holland was given this press conference, and I think it was Daniel Nugent Bowman of the Athletic that asked him about. We well, hear you signed uh, uh, Derek Ryan because I guess he got a tip from, you know, his editor or something during the press conference, and and Holland was a little bit taken aback, and he didn't know the status of the negotiations that it had been. You know, it was a done deal. Like I guess the offer was out there, and they. They accepted. So I thought it was a little strange that they went ahead and did the media avail before all the dust had settled and all their moves. So, but that said, uh, I'm not unhappy at all to add Derek Ryan. He checks a lot of boxes and the contract was pretty good, you know, two years at $1.25 million. Uh, so, you know, it, it's a case where it's close enough to that 1.125 we talked about earlier that if suddenly the wheels fall off and he can't play anymore. They can, you know, they can, they can uh, uh, send him out with minimal expense of, you know, one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars. It would cost him against the cap, very cap. So, the, not so much of a risk. I mean, he is thirty-four years old. The bigger risk is, you know, can he help the team? And and and, and he had an off season a little bit in twenty twenty-one. He only scored two goals after being a, you know, a double-digit scorer for I think four years in a row. Uh, Pucks weren't just weren't going in for him in Calgary, and I think his role was was diminished a little bit. Uh, but what he does do well is stuff Oilers really need. He's a right-handed center, which uh, the only one they have is Ryan Strom. Uh, he's a right-handed center who's very good in the face-off circle, which really they haven't had for a long time. Uh, I guess maybe Boyd Gordon was the last one. Uh, he kills penalties, uh, almost two minutes a night killing penalties, definitely in Calgary's top four all the years that he was there. Uh, and so he's got um, uh, a good background of scoring and a very unique career path. He's a very interesting player. You know, he spent four full years at the University of Alberta Golden Bears. I watched him play a bunch of games at Clare Lake Arena, and he was a hell of a player in college, but he you just said at that time, pick one player off this team that's going to be in the NHL. I, I'm not sure I would have just said, well, it's obviously Derek Ryan. 
Like he, he just kept improving. He went to Europe for four years. He came back. He played one year in the AHL. And suddenly at 29 years old, he was a rookie in the National Hockey League. And he's gone on to play 345 games, NHL games. Like a really quite a remarkable story. And if you look at his statistical profile, he quite kept on improving basically every year. He either his totals went up in the league he was in or he moved on to a newer, tougher league every year right up to age 33. Now he's so he's he's one of those very rare players that that demonstrably improves year after year well into his 30s. So hopefully he's got a little left. Well, you know, his point scoring, like in terms of a total points was not good last year. It doesn't look good. 13 points in 43 games doesn't blow you mm-hmm. away. But when you go by points per 60, Bruce, right. he's at 1.84 points per 60, That's which very good. which it ranks 157th. Mm-hmm. Out of 432 regular NHL forwards, his 101.84 points per 60 is tied with Nazem Kadri and Philip Deneau. Huh. So, so um, hey, that's not bad. And um, there's not, you know, there's miles on this player, but there's not tons of hard miles. I don't think he's he's generally been okay in terms of health. He seems to stay healthy most seasons. In fact, he's been healthy. Um, pretty much all of these seasons. I think he might have been a healthy scratch sometimes in Calgary, if my memory serves a few times. He was on waivers. He got hurt. He, he broke a or finger. Or did he get hurt? Oh, he is missed that all it? the game. He missed 13 games in one goal with a broken finger. So that's okay, another reason go. his stats are down. And his ice time was cut a little bit. And I'm not sure if he was maybe playing hampered for a while or or what. But all the games he missed were due to, due to a single injury. His rate of even strength scoring last year, Bruce, was almost exactly the same as Taylor Hall and Milan Lucic. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. Things are just weird. Uh, well, he's, he came in a little cheaper than both of those guys. He I sure find, did. For me, the, the, the comparable that I'm happy with for, uh, for Ryan that what we know here in Edmonton is Mark Latestu. Who was signed as a, a free agent um, uh, got a three-year deal uh, from Peter Shirelli in the summer of 2015. He was a little bit younger. He was turning 30 at that time, but he was he had a uh, quite a few things in common, like a smaller right shot center, killed penalties. He also played power play, which Ryan has done in the past, and and uh, you know pretty good offensive pedigree, but but played that further down the lineup. And uh, Latestu covered a lot of bets while he was here. He was he was uh, uh, always strong on the faceoff circle as well. But Ryan's faceoff career faceoff percentage over fifty five. That's top notch. Yeah, Latestu was good until he wasn't. I mean, the the wheels really fell off in twenty seventeen eighteen with uh, Mark Latestu. He had but he had been a good player the year before, so um, it, it worked until it didn't, which is often the case with with hockey right. players in their thirties, right? It's it's working, and then it's all of a sudden, it ain't working anymore. So hopefully, Derek Ryan is is going to stay in that it's working category. I heard him on Oilers now. He certainly is well spoken, thoughtful, yes. intelligent, yes. and sounded like he had an admirable character from uh, mm-hmm. from just listening to him, um, in terms of having his head screwed on right. Which, which also describes Mark Lattes too, by the way. He was a great interview. Isn't that the truth? Oh. And had his head screwed on right as well. Mm-hmm. Um, Darnell Nurse Bruce, what do you? So the rumor this year was four years. I was kind of liking that. Um, eight years at nine million, maybe that's what we're going to see. Eight, you know, I was hoping, I was hoping he would there be some, you know, Darnell, you got it. We can't. Uh, we have an internal salary cap structure on this team. We're playing Leon Dreisaitl, former MVP of the league, eight point five million a year. We can't go above that. Are you willing to accept that? And I was, I was hoping he would buy that argument. Um. I'm, I'm increasingly skeptical that's going to be the case when you see players like Zach Wierenski and others um, signing for $9 million plus a year. Now, that was an overpay, I think. That's but uh, way. No, yeah, I'm a fan I just, of I have a fan of Wierenski. I have him in my keeper league. I've followed him pretty closely for a number of years. He is a good player, but I couldn't. I was shocked to see the the price tag. Well, I and, think they have to pay, right? Mm-hmm. Columbus, like it's like one of these cities like Edmonton, as we're starting to hear now, like Edmonton, and like Edmonton, where you got to overpay. Columbus might be in that same boat. Seth Jones, oh, he was at nine and a half. Oh, Dougie Hamilton, nine million. And if you're Darnell Nurse's agent, you can 
point at a couple of those contracts that that's you know how how much worse are you going to tell us Darnell is than these guys and you know it's going to be a, a tougher negotiation because of all these new nine million dollar you know they've just raised the bar on the, uh, you know good uh, mid career defenseman has gone from you know the sevens to the nines just like that. Whatever the contract is, the, the four-year deal actually really appeals to me. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, then then if he, for some reason, gets injured or isn't doesn't, you know, keep improving or regresses, then it's just four years as opposed to eight. I, I would, like, I mean, some, some people might say, well, you want it to make it as long as you can and tie this guy up. Well, if the Oilers are a winning team and he wants to stay after four years, then then he'll sign a new contract here. Yeah. And I just think it covers you on that very risky long term. I mean, I was listening to Ray Ferraro's podcast and he said on these, he was talking about seven years, seven year Mm -hmm. deals. And Ferraro's comment was, I mean, who has seven good years in a row? Nobody. You know, there's exceptions to that. But his point was like he scored 40 goals twice in his career. But those were peak years. And the other years he wasn't that player. So mm-hmm. Darnell Nurse just had a pretty good scoring year, and yeah. but he could easily not have that kind of scoring year um, going forward. So I would prefer four, five, six years as opposed to eight, but I'm not going to squawk. I mean, he, he'll only be 34 at the end of an eight-year deal, I believe, so uh, 34, 35. So it's not crazy towns if, he gets, if, if they go eight years. And um, what do you think? Well, the four years set the stage for a potentially uh, a nervous summer of 2025 with both McDavid and Nurse uh, angling for renegotiations at the end of that season. But uh, uh, the idea, at one level, it makes sense that this is our window. We're going for it now. Sign here, Darnell, and and uh, and then you know you'll still just be what 31 in the summer of uh, of. Uh, 2026, pardon me, because he's still got a year to go and four years on top of that. And McDavid's got five years to go, so it's a five-year window. Yeah. Then he can sign his Seabrook contract. That's when yeah. Seabrook signed. He was 31, I think, when he signed that eight-year new eight-year deal with Chicago that uh, the Blackhawks certainly lived to regret. They just traded it for, uh, for Tyler Johnson. Chicago did. Traded Seabrook to Tampa Bay in their endless bottomless pit long-term injured and preserve fund they'll figure out a way to get the most out of that i'm sure in tampa yeah they sure will they also, they they also signed uh cory perry two times one million i saw that i signed uh eric bogosian three times uh eight hundred and thirty three thousand you rarely see a three-year deal at such a low price for a proven player and they found they signed Alex uh, Boule Boutet Barrett. Barrett. yeah, the, the hyphenated guy. Uh, three years at, at NHL minimum, all three years at NHL minimum. How often do you see a three-year contract at NHL minimum? And he's a guy they signed out a junior that was a great scorer in junior was too small so in other words he's the next tyler johnson the next yanni gore that they just moved on from after getting many years of great service from each guy and now they've got uh, uh the uh, uh another young fellow all lined up on the absolute bargainist of bargain contracts for three years and man do they uh do they know what they're doing down there in Tampa? Anyway, let's move on. That's my little Tampa riff for today. I'm jealous. <laughs> there can only be one Tampa Bay. Um, Bruce, uh, let me see. We had um, NHL commentators rating the Oilers um, deadline day stuff. Mm-hmm. All right. You know, the free agency period, essentially. And the, some people like the Hyman signing. Um, there was a few people who liked the orders overall. Uh, and I didn't... Sports Logic came up with an article on Sportsnet. Um, and they actually had orders as one of the winners. And Sports mm-hmm. Logic is an analytics group. That was interesting. And I didn't have that in my post earlier this week on this. Most of the people that I quoted were negative on, generally speaking, on... Yep. on what the Oilers had done. And I'll just read you, uh, we'll just, for for example, Matt Larkin 
um, of the hockey news. And he had this to say about all of the Oilers' moves. I just don't understand. What are they doing? I'll put the Zach Hyman deal aside. I'm willing to defend it. I think he's going to actually be very helpful in the short term. You have to give him that term and money because it's competitive to sign him. I think he'll be a really nice fit playing with McDavid. I think that the move that move is totally fine, but bringing in guys like Cody Ceci and with term, I just don't understand what this team is doing. You're bringing Duncan Keith, you lose Adam Larson, you trade away Caleb Jones, you trade away Ethan Bear. You've also re-signed Mike Smith into his 40s now for multiple seasons. I just can't condone the decisions overall of this team. I don't know if this team is better. I don't believe that, but I could be wrong. So I think that kind of sums up the general mood of the outside experts mm-hmm. on the Oilers. That those comments were were fairly typical. In the end, we're, we're and we're closer to the end than we are to the beginning of this Oof. free agents. There might be there might be one big move, like for a go- like they might figure out a way to bring in a goalie. But other than that, they're just going to have little moves. What do you think in the end, Bruce? Of uh, would you say the orders were a winner or a loser in this free agency period? Yeah, well, I mean, the Adam Larson thing, I mean, if you want to blame the orders for losing Adam Larson, and there are people that are that are doing that, um, then uh, uh, if you consider him part of the pitcher, then to me, certainly CC for Larson is a downgrade, uh, a little bit Huge. lower money. A little bit lower money, you know, uh, so expectations should be a little lower. To me, they're paying CC as a 4-5, and the uh, sooner he's a 5, the better in some ways. You know, like if he's on your third pairing, you're probably not in that bad of shape. But if he's on your top four, you know, you're pushing uh, a little harder. But I think the idea is he's a placeholder a little bit for uh, Evan Bouchard. And uh, what, sooner Bouchard pushes into the top four, you know, and, and justifiably so, uh, the better for, for everyone. Uh, if you want to blame the Oilers, though, for blowing the Adam Larson negotiations, um, uh, then that puts them more in the camp of loser for sure. What they've certainly done is changed the, the face and the look of the team. I mean, those are pretty significant moves as a Five guys they signed or traded for on uh, on Wednesday, and one that was a returnee in Tyson Berry, and that I mean we talked about probably more than a couple podcasts that Larson was the preferred retained guy over Barry, and I held out hopes that Seattle might do with Barry what they ultimately did with Larson, which was sign him during the free agent window, but that's. That's not how it worked out. And it kind of started this other cascade of, well, we brought back this small defenseman. We got to move on from from another one. And they, they really reworked their defense. You know, Jones, Jones uh, Bear, uh, Larson, all out. And Keith and um, Cece in. I, th- I think they still may sign another defenseman. Um, they definitely have uh, upgraded up front. Uh Hyman's a, uh, a better player for the top six than any other options that, that they had in-house. And Fogel is a really good solution for improving the bottom six, which desperately needed improvement after getting waxed uh, last year to the tune of 35% goal share. I mean, fixing the bottom six is a, is a priority. And I guess one way to look at it is you can say, well, they brought in Derek Ryan, Warren Fogel, Zach Hyman, let's flip Zach Hyman to his natural right wing and just say they're a forward line. How would that? How would they do as a forward line? Would they outscore their opposition? Would they, you know, improve Edmonton's chances of winning a, you know, a, sort of a, a, a hypothetical game situation? Are they are they going to help you win games? And I I think yes, and I think you know that. They would perform well as a line. They will be split up onto at least two, if not three, different lines. But those those players are going to help up front. And the concern for me is the back end. Duncan Keith is a massive gamble, and not um, not free agent related, but certainly off season related. That was the you know the first move that sort of triggered the the avalanche was bringing him in, and Keith. Like, there are 
there are some folks that have written the guy off. Um, he was in a kind of a tough circumstance in Chicago, though, where he was playing. Uh, they really had one decent right-hand defenseman in Connor Murphy, and he didn't play a lot with Murphy. He played a lot with younger guys and uh, a lot of top four minutes. So, uh, my friend Darcy McLeod, Wood guy, he does a he does very occasionally he writes blog posts for his post Wood blog, and he did a really deep dive into Duncan Keith's uh, um, situation in Chicago, who he played with, who he played, you know, caliber t- player he played against, and so on. And his conclusion was a lot more positive than uh, if you just sort of looked at the numbers and say, here's a here's a 38 year old guy that's fallen off the cliff and is, you know, heading for heading for a hard landing. Uh, and his takeaway was that no, he's he's a better player. At least my read of his takeaway was he's a better player than than uh, uh, than some have concluded. And it's a huge gamble, but. Uh, Keith brings things that uh, were certainly going to change the look of the team. Ideally, he would have been paired with Adam Larson. Secondary choice, he would have been paired with Ethan Bear. Well, neither of those things are going to happen. He's probably going to wind up with CeCe. And we will CeCe. Yeah, yeah. Um, we'll see with Duncan Keith. I mean, if we've mm-hmm. talked about this a lot. I think most yeah. people commenting on him having seen him play last year and until i see him play i'm not going to hazard a guess uh bruce they they headed into free agency with a lot of money they had a yeah. lot of money to solve problems they had a big need they had a need at um well their top they needed two left wingers essentially um with nugent yeah. hopkins unsigned and they needed a third line center and i think they needed a goalie i think they needed yeah. to, to bring in a goalie so they those were the needs heading into free agency and then um, uh, whether I don't really care who's to blame for Larson or leaving or not, it's, he just left. Right. Yeah, that's the He's fact strong. of the matter. So yeah. I'm just like, objectively, are they better or worse? Yeah, that makes them a whole lot. So then they had this huge need on uh, right defense. Absolutely, it suddenly became um, almost their biggest need, probably their biggest need. You know, because they had already locked down Hyman by then, so it became their biggest need. And and um, so obviously they filled the left wing spot, and I think they. I don't like the eight year term of either of those uh, contracts for Hyman or Nuge, but the the cap hits are are lower than um, be, because the terms longer, the cap hits were lower, and that's the trade they made. and And I also get the idea of winning now. So you, so you make these maybe not great long term bets in order to win now. So I think that's I I understand the thinking, and I in the end I approve of both of those deals more than I disapprove of them. So that's a win. The goalie thing, this is not a win. And they have yet to resolve the Koskinen thing. And and from listening to Mark Spector on orders now, it sounded like almost like they got to move Koskinen because he's no longer accepted on his team. Like, like they got to move him out because the players don't trust him anymore in net. And there's this problem. And it's started to feel like this Milan Lucic thing where you just got to move the guy because it's just, you, you got to nope. move him. You just no got to what? You got to go. Yeah. So... That was kind of a, I didn't like the sound of that because Koskinen actually was a pretty good goalie two years ago. He had a nine nine seventeen save percentage, top half of NHL starters. He wasn't he was not good last year overall, but he was good in stretches. And I just mm-hmm. I thought for like your one B goalie who plays mm-hmm. thirty five games, let's say, or you know, the, I don't that doesn't strike me in the category of you must move this guy out category. Mm -hmm. I do think they need to improve that position and they, that should have been one of that should be one of the goals. So they, to me, that's a fail. And then the way they filled in for Larson, I'm going to assume it's the best they could have done under the circumstances in a scramble mode. Like, you know, you're the quarterback, it's broken down, you're scrambling for your life and you throw a, a hail Mary pass. And, and one time out of five, one time out of three, one time out of five, you get the, the the big play, and and then the other times you're sacked and you're maybe even concussed. So this is this is the this is what's just happened here. Is Ken Holland's been running around the backfield, you know, trying to pick out a receiver and f- tossing the ball into the air and praying. And and you know the solution that he came up with, you know, it's it's Barry's not a terrible hockey player. He's an NHL hockey player and a great puck mover, and a weak defender. 
So, and then CC, I can't comment on. Like he, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm, I haven't seen him play. I don't think he's from what what it sounds like. The best is maybe he'll hang in there in the top four for maybe this year, maybe. Um, so, I don't think that was a success. What happened with Larson and then the way they solved the problem? I don't. It was a tough one. That was a real hard one. But I don't think it was a success. So, overall, um, I do think they will be a better team next year. Because of internal improvement of young players stepping up and getting better. And in, in, in an inconsiderable improvement on the wing with uh, Hyman and Fogel helping out quite a bit, yes. I think. And Yamamoto and Pugliarvi getting better. And Derek Ryan playing um, st- stronger hockey than we've gotten from Kara and other people who have been Tourist. filling that role, tourists, mm-hmm. in the last few years. So I, I think overall the team's going to be better. Mm-hmm. But I, I think... Where the Oilers a loser of one of the worst teams at the deadline in the NHL, I don't buy that. I don't believe that. But did the did the moves that had just happened in the last month make the improve the team well? And compared to having all that cap space that they had to spend, um, I'm going to say no. That's mm-hmm. it's a little. It's a, I'm somewhat disappointed overall mm-hmm. with how it turned out. I'm not terribly disappointed but i'm a little bit that's where i'm left yeah the cop space it sure went in a hurry didn't it so it did. this this is where uh, uh to me the the keith trade uh just leaving keith himself out of it but just the exchange of the money situation there that was a huge huge gamble by holland and his inability to get chicago to either retain or to take back Koskinen, which was the original offer apparently, and just take on all of the all of the cap hit. Uh, that took a huge bite out of his budget before he even started. And then, you know, by the time he got done signing all these other guys, Hyman seven year deal, by the way, not eight. That was uh, Kyle Dubas throwing a monkey wrench into things. But uh, uh, they, you know, by the time they got high, uh, you know, yeah, that's Hyman, a, lo- yeah, that's a lot of. That's a lot of money contracts, you know. It's uh, five and a half for Keith. It's it's five and a half for Hyman. It's uh, uh, three and a quarter for CC. It's two and three quarters for um, Fogel. You know, that's uh, that's a lot of dough being uh, uh, being spent. That's seventeen million right there, and that was basically the budget. Even with the buyout of James Neal, they don't have a lot of room to move, so they're. They're left with the goalies they had, unless they can work out some kind of trade. And, uh, and there's uh, been chatter about that. That's, uh, we'll get to that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I didn't like that CC contract at mm-hmm. all. I mean, mm-hmm. for, for the caliber of defenseman that people talk about him being, like that was an mm-hmm. overpay in term, terms of both term and salary, it seemed like. And maybe, that, you know, the one, that, one of the things that we all have to consider in thinking about the Edmonton Oilers thinking about the NHL is like we know this in the NBA now the players are the GMs the star players run that league and with their agents and they they figure out well I'm going to play with you and you're going to play like we're going to and we're going to recruit him and we're going to put together this super team that's the NBA right now we don't have that in our heads about the NHL yet because it's not quite there yet but I think it it is on it is kind of the reality this is a this is a league where the agents have the power and um, they decide where who's going to get who and which team is going to go up and which team is going to go down. And, they, and the GMs are trying to persuade them and doing what they can. And But really, it's the agents who, who hold the cards and, and the power. And, you know, so the Oilers, you know, and, and my point on this is when you're judging how Holland did, you have to try to figure out what exactly were his options. They might have had a list of 15 players. Um for right D to fill in for Adam Larson. But if this top eight guys on that list, there's just no way they're coming here. Right. It's not happening, which was the case. This is well, you know, it's been widely discussed. Now, Dougie, he's just not coming here. So people say, well, they should have spent, yeah, add up what CeCe got and you add up what Barry got and you could have got Dougie Hamilton. It's, it's not, it was not going to happen. This player just wasn't interested in, in, in Canada or Edmonton. <clears throat> That's what so, I so what I would suggest to, to as we, all of us, me and you and every other fan, if you're not taking that into consideration, if you're just brushing that aside and saying, oh, that's BS, that's apology for the team, 
that's that's letting that's letting them off the hook and carrying water. No, I think actually, if you don't take that, if you don't take that as one of the important variables in this, then your 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 analysis is missing a huge piece. It's stupid analysis essentially. Like it's a huge factor in how the NHL is run right now. These agents have power. They decide. Players don't want to go places. It's it's not this unlimited field uh, for Ken Holland to rec- recruit players. It's a very small field, and that's how you end up, I think, with the Cody CC contract. Spe- uh, but that's not to let the GM off the hook completely, though, because they can make mistakes. Go ahead, Bruce. Sorry. Yeah, I was just going to say you have the G, um, the agent, uh, J.P. Barry, the agent of both Adam Larson and Oscar Clapbaum, who also happens to be the agent of Cody CC, saying, well, now that you have a big hole in right defense for the next four years, boy, do I have a solution for you. And it's, you know, and, and he wants to. To play, he's happy playing in Canada. He played in Ottawa and Toronto, and he's happy to play wherever. So, you know, they then whether they paid a premium for I mean, he made more than that in both Ottawa and Toronto. He was up in the four or four and a half million dollar range, and he had a, a correction last year. He went to Pittsburgh on a one year, $1.2 million contract, had an excellent year, and it paid off for him. And he got, um, you know, he got back in the moderate uh, price zone of defensemen. He did have a good year, though. Like He was a, he was an outscorer, and he had pretty good points. I think he had a lot of second assists, and I think he definitely got a bump from the percentages. And I think he also had uh, more sort of third-pairing class competition in Pittsburgh than he's probably going to see in Edmonton. So some of those chickens will come home to roost. Yeah, the contract worry, like the, you know, the whole, again, I, I'm not, I can't rate the player. I haven't seen him play, but it just has the feel of like, we've had a lot of veteran defensemen come in at that amount, like Fane and Ference and McKeon was a little bit more, but a lot of them have come in and not really worked out. So I'm just fingers crossed. It's, it's going to work out better this time. But again, to me, it's one of those 50, 50 bets, not at like, not that 80, 20 bet that you'd like to make, but maybe the 80, 20, like when you're scrambling, when you're that quarterback, you don't have the 80, 20 percentage play you're you're going for something Mm -hmm. a little bit more desperate uh and speaking of desperation bruce there was a rumor here like of all the rumors that i i I was a little upset at the duncan keith stuff and and sad about the adam larson thing like frustrated Mm -hmm. and sad about what happened there although larson was free to move and i completely wish him well in the other city that he's gone to which i don't will not name um the rumor that i don't like that I've liked the least of any rumor that I've heard uh, is this one that came out yesterday. And I think Frank Saravalli started it with the idea was they're going to trade Miko Koskinen in his $4.5 million per year contract uh, with one year left to Columbus for Eunice Corposalo. I think he's got, what is his contract? One year at 2.8. 2. 2. 2. 8. 8. Yeah. So there's $1.7 million different. So you trade these two goalies, Koskinen's, 33, 34, Corpus Allo is what, 26, 27? Yep. Considerable difference in age there. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the the Oilers to get Corpus Allo would have to throw in a first pick and or, wasn't exactly and. clear, and Dmitry Samarukov. And when I heard that, my it was just like, God, this can't be true. Like, tell me this isn't true. Mm-hmm. This isn't happening. This can't be happening. Because just a quick look at the stats, Corpus Allo's stats are are worse than Koskinen's stats for the last two years. Mm-hmm. He is not statistically a better goalie. And I can see trading this kind of stuff, Koskinen, it's a salary dump when Edmonton moves him. You're going to have to give up something. I can see that if you're going to get a better goalie, if you're going to get, uh, what's the guy from Arizona, Darcy Kemper. Right. I wouldn't like, I, I don't want to see Sam Rukov go. I like the player a lot, but I could see trading the first pick in Koskinen for, uh, for Kemper. That would be okay. You're getting a better goalie probably, but for Corpus Salo. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh man, Bruce, it made my head hurt. And then, so finally Ryan Rashog at the end, like people were venting, including me all day on, uh, on social media about this. And, and Ryan Rashog of TSN finally ended it a little bit and calmed everybody down somewhat. He said, quote, Corpusalo for Koskinen and a high pick or prospect is not something the organization is considering at the moment. Mm-hmm. Have a great long weekend, everyone. And so that I was relieved to, to read, even though there was the at the moment in there, I was relieved. To, 
I was relieved to hear Ryan say that. Maybe they just saw the blowback and thought, oh, geez, and, and had a second look at this. Bruce, what was your reaction? Uh, about the rumors, I, I yeah. just about made my head explode. That the, <laughs> you know, I mean, Sarah Valley's a credible source. Uh, and we have the recent example of the Duncan Keith rumors where we were sort of going, well, they'd never do that. Surely they'd make them retain or they'd take something back or they'd send us some assets or something. And none of that stuff happened. And in fact, the worst um, fears of a, of a Keith trade came to be that the Oilers gave and gave and gave and took the whole contract back. So, you know, when you when you when you have that in the sort of recent uh, memory banks, uh, it makes it tougher to take. But uh, uh, I mean, Corpus Allo, uh, his his uh, last he had a good rookie year with a 920 save percentage, and then since then 905, 897, 897, 911, 894. Like that's not even average NHL goalie. That's you know I mean well to me, that, average. The 900 save percentage that is the Mendoza line of hockey. If yeah. You're below that, you you know you're just not getting her done, and. I, I just cited their stats side by side. Like uh, uh, Koskinen uh, Koskin had better goals against, better save percentage, better one loss record. And I got some pushback from people saying, if you're looking at their stats and not the actual players playing different teams and different teams, this is the NHL. There's a sort of a, a, a standard of play for, I mean, sure, they didn't have any common opponents, any of that stuff. But I don't buy for a minute that Columbus was a complete tire fire, whereas Edmonton is somehow this above average team or something that that, that the, the platforms are that different. They're playing against NHL competition, and neither of them had a good year. But, you know, Corpus Allo has been below that 900 mark three out of the last four years. Why are you targeting that for at all? Let alone, why are you targeting that? And, and so... As I understood it, Sarah Valley said that was basically the ask from Columbus, and that's it just remains an ask. And I mean, the big okay. difference from that being an ask from Columbus as opposed to that being an offer from Edmonton. There's an enormous difference between those two things. But it got out there on social media, and of course, immediately became, why would Holland be offering that? What an idiot. He's got to be the worst ever. And, you know, and away they went. And uh, just turned into this huge. I, I, I literally just, when it started, I just turned off my phone and walked away from it for several hours. I just, I don't even want to get yeah. in. I don't even want to go here. It's just... I did. You know what? I didn't, I was thinking, <laughs> am I going to write about this? Like, you know, we write, I write about the rumors you write about. We sometimes write about these. And I just thought, no, I, I just, I'm tired. I'm mm-hmm. not writing about this. No. I just hope it goes away. I was thinking, I was trying to think of all the time Frank Saravalli's been wrong. And I thought, okay, well, just two weeks ago, he rumored about Dougie Hamilton maybe coming to the Oilers, right? He, he, he wrote a speculative piece and said that was a possibility. So I was thinking, okay, maybe this is like that. Maybe this is just him trying to piece the other things. But it's, I don't know. There was enough out there that there was, seems like this was, was being talked about. Now, listen, if they trade, if you traded Corpus Allo for Koskinen straight up, that would be a good deal for the Oilers because they're similar goalies and they're similar enough that that would be okay. It would actually, you, the orders I think have to, if they're going to trade for Koskin and for Corpus Allo, they must add a sweetener. So the idea that the Edmonton has, because he gets paid a million seven more, but you know, um, Patrick Marlowe was sent to the Toronto Maple Leafs earning 6.2 million, is, if I recall correctly. And that cost a f- 6.2 uh, million cap, it cost a first round pick. This is $1.7 million difference in their the contract. It shouldn't cost a first. And and for a one, a player on one year, yeah, one year cap hit shouldn't cost. It should not cost a first pick, and more or Dmitry Samarkov. That's that's where this just like. So what should it cost? One point seven million dollars. Let's say they're, they're they're valued about the same, or cost Corpus Allo's valued a little higher because he's younger. What sh- what would then be a reasonable sweetener? It would be an interesting question. Maybe a third round pick, maybe a second round pick, but a first and a prospect like Sam Marukov, like forget it. Like anyway, that's the ask. It's not. It's not. I gotta. It's just the ask. 
Corpusello had one good season in 1920 where he was 9-11. He had 60% quality starts, which is good, uh, which is a number where he's actually been very poor, 41, 38, and 42% quality starts in the other three years lately. But he, he had a strong playoffs where he beat Toronto in a high-profile series. And a couple of games were shutouts. There was overtimes, you know. There was, uh, uh, and then uh, uh, eventually they lost out in the in the second round uh, of the playoffs. But he did, you know, he had a decent run in the playoffs. But I would take four years of, of data over two playoff series worth of data, ten days out of ten. And he's um, to me averages would be kind. Yeah, and I don't know what else is out there now. Maybe like I. Someone was rumoring that Anton Huboden mm-hmm. from Dallas might be available. They got Bishop and they brought in another goalie, did they not, in Dallas? I'm just trying to think. Uh, I think they brought in another goalie. Uh, Holtby? Um, did they bring in Holtby? Dallas got Holtby. At least so. So, so there's, there's, anyway, someone was talking about Huboden being available. Now, you know, so, so again, I'm not the orders against the orders paying a big price to bring in a goalie, like in, including the first pick, including Sam Rukov, like if that's what it takes. Make sure, though, this is a, you know, this is definitely an upgrade because if it's not, what are you doing? So maybe we all got our noses out of joint for nothing is the truth. Like let's, mm-hmm. let's, let's, our hair goes on fire pretty quickly and easily here, which is, uh, you know, uh, uh, the dynamic of the orders. Yeah fan base especially on twitter mm-hmm. i mean there's just some people who have the knives sharp and and anything they're they're wanting to stick that knife in as deep as they can but you know that got everybody going i think pretty much there wasn't some people remain calm in the face of that rumor i was not one of them mm-hmm. let me just see holt the no, no, it's just they've just got Hudobin and Jake Ottinger currently listed on their roster, at least as per. Uh, uh, oh, next thing, sorry. Got no, they signed Holtby, I think. Let me see. Yeah, no, uh, let me get Dallas this Stars. Yeah. They got Holtby and Hudobin and Ottinger. And Bishop, because Bishop hasn't gone anywhere. Okay, and I thought. Has he. Uh, I'm just reading a blog post. The Dallas Stars do not expect Ben Bishop to play for them again, at least not for the upcoming regular season. If they did, it would be hard to justify bringing in a fourth goaltender in addition to Bishop, Anton Huboden, and Jake Ottinger. What does Bishop earn? Probably way too much. Big, um, big money, but he's been he's been fighting injuries the whole time. He yeah, so all this Ottinger's year. a good young goalie. Um I, I'm. I bet you they're looking at Ottinger and Bishop. Uh, Ottinger and Holtby is like. Why do you bring in Holtby if you think Huboden's going to play? Because you have Ottinger, uh, who was okay. Anyway, so that I don't know if if you could work out something there. Like, would you trade Koskinen and first for Huboden, for instance? Um, now Holland has said he won't do a one year rental. I don't think Huboden's actually. Well, I think on he's a got two. Contract. I think he's got two more years. So so. I'm just speaking off the top of my head. You know, we're making up stuff now on the fly, which which is when we get in trouble, Bruce. Uh, But (laughs) does that make sense? It it makes, just off the top of my head, it makes more sense than the um, other deal we were talking about. So anyway, we'll see what the orders do there. I I wonder if they will solve this goalie thing. You know, it's been suggested Bob Stoffer and orders now has, has said several times, maybe you just go into the season with these goalies. Right. This is the point I wanted to make. Let's say, let's say the reason you're trying to make this this trade is you got to move Koskinen because it's just not working out. He wants out. The team's lost confidence in his glove hand, as Mark Spector suggested on Oilers. Now, um, it's time for him to go. Here's here's maybe what you do though. If you can't get a decent a deal that makes sense, is you go to your team leaders. You call them together, Duncan Keith and McDavid and all these other guys, and you say, listen, you know we're not we can't give away the farm in order just to move up. He's struggling. We know this guy's struggling. You know that we, but so here's what we're going to do. We have Alex Stalock under contract. Mm -hmm. He's going to be our backup. He's, he's plan a, Uh, he and Mike Smith are plan a and Koskinen uh, has to fight to, to get ahead of them. That may happen. And if that does, we expect full, we expect full support from, from our leadership group with this player 
until we're able to, and maybe he'll surprise you. He has played well in the past. And if he doesn't, and if Stalock doesn't, then we are definitely, that's item number one this year through the year is we have a first pick that we are willing to move in order to get a goalie this year. And that's what we're going to be trying to do all year long. Um, if these other two goalies don't work, can you live with that? And, you know, I think the answer should be yes. That that should be the plan rather than make a, you know, the kind of trade that was suggested, whether it has the air of reality or not with Corpus Allo. Well, maybe Corpus Allo trains with uh, McDavid, <laughs> Nurse, uh, Fogel, Hyman, Shore, all those fellows that Gary Roberts uh, um, boot okay. camp there. Could, could Koskinen <laughs> Could Koskinen get an invite, maybe, or is he like a <laughs> is he a snitch without, you know, like? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, makes me wonder. It is a, that that was an interesting um, little snippet the orders let out there about all those guys training together, and it it uh, it raised some questions. But you know, my take was that uh, better off bringing in McDavid's friends and going out and trading for his mortal enemy, like uh, Pete Chiarelli did. So. <laughs> makes there some logic to it anyway uh, <clears throat> I didn't mind uh, I don't know, I'm sorry I'm just thinking about something else just trying to just I'll get the one final piece of information here any final thoughts Bruce I yeah, can't talk yeah, about ben, contract Ben Bishop never moved from Dallas I thought I'd seen him moving around but he's been there and he missed the entire playoffs in 2020 when they went to the Stanley Cup finals and then he never played at all last year and uh, he sounds like he's in the Anton, or sorry, the Oscar Kleffbaum mode of, of you know, being out indefinitely. So, uh, Hudobin's a nice guy, but an old, older goalie, and he's got term. So, two years know, at three point three million, Bruce. Right. That's um, not terrible. That's, that's not terrible. terrible. He has a uh, no trade clause. Player submits a four team no trade list. So. Um, Buffalo, Edmonton, Winnipeg, and uh, no. Columbus. Like yeah. all the teams that need a goalie, maybe. All the teams that need a goalie that he doesn't want to go to. Hey, maybe he could be persuaded to come here. This, You never know, because it's not like Edmonton is a team. There's no, There are some benefits of playing at Edmonton. You get to play with Connor McDavid and Dreisaitl and on, on a pretty good team here. And um, so anyway... We'll see what happens on the goalie front. We shall see, Bruce. All right. Uh, it's final. a major outstanding issue right now. I mean, they, yeah. they they dealt with, what for better or worse, they dealt with issues elsewhere on the roster, and the goalie situation just remains unchanged. The only thing they did there was bring back Mike Smith. So they basically, you know, they brought back last year's starter. They still have last year's backup. They still have the, the black box mystery that is Alex Stalock and three guys pushing from below that if you went out and signed a, another goalie for for term then that blocks the path for any of those guys so for realize goaltending is a different equation than any other position but uh, if you're a Stuart Skinner and you've already been a pro for three years and you're facing a fourth year in the in the farm and all of a sudden you're looking up at two goalies that have multi-year contracts up there and you're starting to think, well, where do I fit? So playing out the Koskinen card uh, as the backup with Stalock as the backup backup, it's not a completely untenable solution unless the players have utterly lost confidence in Koskinen, and even that can change. You know, the guy comes back, he gets hot, and, you know. Yeah. And they have Stalock, right? Like, they got in this other NHL goalie. He he missed all of last year, though, and he's not young. He's 30, no. 33, 34. None of them is young. None Koskinen, of them are young. Koskinen is 33, and he's the youngest of the three. So The pup. Mm. All righty. Well, Bruce, why don't we leave it there? Sure. That's good. Thanks for talking. All right. Thanks for listening, everyone. And in the meantime, and in between times, this has been another edition of the Cult of Hockey podcast. I hope Ethan Bear crushes it in Carolina. Me too. <laughs>